Whiskey. There's a pub public menorah lighting tonight, so we have competition. It's good. Yesterday I went to the city. Yeah? The city was good? Yeah. Lots of people? Quite a lot. Not as many as before, but... No Palestinian no. demonstrators? Very good. No. They are there on Sunday. Huh? Who cares? Every, every, every Sunday. Every Sunday. Yeah, from me. Okay, so um, we'll start. Uh, just a second. Let me turn on the machine. Yeah. So um, we're going to have a shit. We're going to learn some mignonim of Hanukkah together. Um, but what I'd like to do before we start is to take you to the end, really, um, so that everyone knows what the journey is, is about. You know, let me give you a marshal. Um, a koala bear doesn't have a tail. Right? A dog has a tail. They're a similar size. They're animals, both cute, both nice. But you can't confuse a koala bear with a dog, right? Does that mean because the dog has a tail that he's better than the koala bear? Does it, if the koala bear can climb trees, does that mean that he's better than a dog? It doesn't mean that at all. But you can't tell me that they're not different. A koala bear and a dog are different. One's not better than the other, but they are different. Hanukkah is about the fact that Jews need to understand that they're different from non-Jews. Now, that doesn't mean, I'm not suggesting any level of superiority, not suggesting any level of, um, that one should be arrogant or proud of, uh, uh, but one has to understand that Jews and non-Jews share a lot of things in common. A dog and a, and a koala bear both have blood supplies, both have a heart, both have a brain, both have uh, toe, uh, nails at, at the end of their paws. But just because they have things that are similar in many, many, many areas doesn't make them the same. They're different animals. And the... the fundamental thing that a Jew needs to understand if he's going to make any sense of his life is that he is different to a non-Jew and that doesn't mean better or worse but it does mean different and th that difference unless a Jew learns to be in tune with that difference he is going to live a life which is much less rewarding and much less colourful and much less um, satisfying than he is if he, if he does understand these differences. And Hanukkah is about the difference between Jews and non-Jews. And these differences, um, we're going to go through some of them in a minute, and. But the fundamental one is this. The fundamental one is that a Jew, and actually, before we come to that, let's, let's define what a Jew is. Let's start with what a Jew isn't. We, certainly we are a different culture in many ways, although today, when education is becoming very much more integrated, Jewish education and non-Jewish education is very similar. Um, even if you get kids going to a Jewish school, they're learning the same algebra and the same mathematics and the same uh, English and the same history, etc., etc. And they go to the same university to learn a trade. That wasn't always the case, but today it is the case. So the cultural differences have become less obvious than they used to be. So 
you can, if, if you want to say, well, what's a Jew? What, what makes a Jew a Jew? So one answer is to talk about their culture. Maybe that's an answer. Um, one aspect is to say that we're a, a different race. That was Hitler's argument, Yemak Shomoy. That's also wrong. How do you know it's wrong? Because when you, when you have a Jew who converts, and he converts according to halakha, he is 100% a Jew. Not 99%, but 100% a Jew. Are you telling me that he's from the same race? What does that mean? A race implies that somebody is born into a, into a, into a uh, from parents of the same blood type or whatever it is that Hitler Yamak Shemoy was trying to prove. It's nonsense. But Judaism is not about a racial difference. We've never suggested that it was. Ah, you want to tell me that Jews are um, not comfortable uh, making conversion easy? That, that, that's for a very different reason altogether. The reason that we don't accept um, that conversion should be simple and easy is that as a matter of regard, as a matter of kindness, to a non-Jew, we need to explain to that non-Jew so that he gets it very clearly that it's better to be a good non-Jew than a bad Jew. And, a, and a, a good Jew is not defined in the same way as a good Gentile. A good Gentile is defined as somebody who's maybe honest, who's maybe um, uh, caring, who's maybe socially, uh, takes his social responsibilities seriously, who's artistic, all sorts of different things. That's not what it, being a good Jew is. Being a good Jew is learning Torah and doing mitzvahs. Very simple. So if, if, you, want to, if you want to say that, that it, we're a race, that's nonsense because a convert, a convert isn't from the same racial background and he's still 100% Jewish. So what is the difference between a Jew and a non-Jew? So we learn that everybody has a, every creature alive has a, a, a nefesh, a life force. And that life force powers the physical because our world is a combination of spiritual and physical. And even amongst those creatures and plants and, and molecules and atoms that are... are uh, physical, there is a spiritual component. And that spiritual component um, needs to be understood as a spiritual component. So every creature on the, in, in creation has a soul and a body, has a life force and a goof. But a Jew has a different soul to a non-Jew. Tanya says it's an additional soul Depends how you learn. It's a different, an additional soul, the nefesh elokis, as opposed to the nefesh abamis, or it may be that we learn differently that it's a different level to this to the soul. But the difference between a Jew and a non-Jew is is in his neshama. Now, so that it's understood clearly, a neshama is inherited through the mother, um, or it's earned. It's accessible. So you can have a Chinese, black, um, Malaysian, whatever he is, and if he or she wants to convert to Judaism and puts in the work, learns the Torah, does what the halakha requires, goes to the mikveh, becomes a Jew, he's a Jew. 100% full Jew. What about his neshama? He's earned it. He gets it when he immerses in the mikveh. Are you telling me how can an immersion in a mikveh add a level to your soul? This isn't a measurable physical phenomenon. It's, it's a spiritual reality. So Jews 
But to say that a non-Jew, to say that that convert before his conversion is the same thing as the Jew he becomes after the conversion is wrong. There is a different, he earns and, and takes on a different level to his neshama. And that gives him completely different responsibilities. What are those responsibilities? For a, for a, a non-Jew, the responsibilities are to build Gashmias and, and infuse some spirituality into that Gashmias. So it's perfectly possible for a non-Jew to listen to an achingly beautiful piece of music, some Matthew Passion by Bach, so beautiful that he's moved to tears. What, what do you think that is? That's a spiritual moment for that person. But that's not what we're talking about in terms of the spiritual responsibility of a Jew. A spiritual responsibility of a Jew is to learn Torah and do mitzvahs. Ah, can he enjoy music? Of course he can. But that is the, not the difference. The difference is that we have to learn Torah and do mitzvahs. And if we learn Torah and do mitzvahs, we lead a different kind of life. It's not a matter of pursuing a good life. It's a matter of pursuing a godly life. And for a Jew to flower and for a Jew to be um, uh, fulfill his destiny and reach a personal sense of fulfillment, he needs to be tuned into this difference. Because if he tries to live like a Gentile, it, it, all the things that are good for a Gentile are good for a Jew. But it won't be enough. Lots of money is nice. It won't be enough. Nachas from children is nice. It won't be enough. Um, winning fights, winning wars, nice. won't be enough. For a Jew, the only thing that is enough is the relationship that he forms with his God through learning Torah and doing mitzvahs. And when he does that and becomes conscious of his shlichus, so we'll try and get time to talk about that, when, he gets con when he's conscious of the fact that that relationship that he's building gives him certain tasks and certain responsibilities in life, then when he fulfills those tasks and responsibilities, there is a different level of personal satisfaction. Now, is there anti-Semitism? Is, 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 if you want to say that Jews are different, but... Um, but not superior, they're not superior, they have a different job to do. They have a job to bring Rukhnis into Gashmis and elevate Gashmis into Rukhnis. For that they have to have better, different equipment. That different equipment is this different level to their soul. The, if a Jew tries to beat anti-Semitism, by living like a non-Jew, doesn't work. History has proved that that doesn't work. If the Jew wants, if the if the Jew wants to escape anti-Semitism by being generous with his money, then he's criticised. If he's mingy with his money, he's criticised. If he's outgoing, he's criticised. He makes too much noise. If he's too quiet, he's criticised. He doesn't make enough noise. Why? So the Rebbe has explained in a long Fabringen that anti-Semitism is a virus and explains where that virus comes from and explains that it will never go away. Like any virus, what it does is it morphs. It morphs in from one, one uh, form to another form, like any virus does. So you, you, you have the COVID virus, you attack it with a, with a medicine or a, a, um, a, a what do you call it? A, 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 
uh, vaccination, and it morphs into a different strain. You don't... Anti-Semitism has taken many, many forms over the years, right? It's taken... You've just read a chapter of this in the book. It's, it, you have, you've had, first of all, Jews were accused of killing the Christian God. I mean, it's so laughable. How, how can any intelligent person believe you can kill a God? And yet, if very intelligent people have believed that and, and, and murdered Jews by the millions in the Crusades and in, the, in, in, the, in Spain... <laughs> all in the name of religion. Okay, then religion became unfashionable, comes the 19th and 19th century, it becomes unfashionable and, and you get an, a liberalism. So all of a sudden, the, the, the Jews are liberal. Or you get Marxism, and then, then Jews are, are, are blamed for having too much money or, or blamed for... When Marxism becomes unpopular, they're communists. And it's, their fault is political. When that doesn't work anymore, racism is invented. You know, racism what didn't exist until, until the 19th century. It was in, invented by a German. A hundred years before Hitler, you might should know. Eighty years before Hitler. Then Hitler dressed it up and, and made it into, a, into the, the kind of religion that he did. And people believe, believed it. Now, how can an intelligent person believe, believe in this racial <coughs> superiority and the inferiority? When demonstrably you can have a person with a high level of intelligence and a high level of this and I, from, from each of the races, what does it mean? So then all of a sudden racism has become the dirty word. We, have to, we live in a politically correct society. So the, the virus morphs again. Now it's, it's the human rights. All of a sudden, Jews deny human rights. You ever heard of anything like this? Mm. Ethnic cleansing, we, we've been accused of. Apartheidism, we've been accused, accused of. Little Israel, smaller than <clears throat> Tasmania, with Alavai, seven million Jews, is the centre of world attention all the time. Why? Because this anti-Semitism is a virus. And where does the virus come from? Explains the Rebbe this, that once we got the Torah on Har Sinai and we were given this special responsibility and we were given the responsibility of bringing Rukhnius into Gashmius and elevating Gashmius into Rukhnius, there had to be immediately an opposing force. If you have a force for good, you have to have an opposing force for bad, otherwise you're not going to have free choice. <clears throat> and in order to have free choice, there has to be total, absolute choice between good and bad. So if we're going to be doing God's work, which is good, not every Jew is good. But if Jews collectively are empowered and, and, um, and told to do God's work, then straight away there's going to have to be a massive opposition to that. And that's what anti-Semitism is. It's not bound, based on any logic, it's not based on any... It, it, it's just a, it's a virus that exists because... So when that virus exists, it's, there's no point in trying to, pan to the, uh, pander to these people. You know, if 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 kids in universities who haven't got a clue, they don't know what a Palestinian is, they don't know what, they don't know the history of, of Israel, they don't know that there was no Palestine, they don't know that, about the, the uh, Ottoman Empire, they don't know about the division of the Arab states <coughs> and, and how England was, had the mandate for, for this territory. They don't know anything about that. All they know is that Free, free the Palestinians. They don't know who the Palestinians are. They don't know who Hamas are. They don't know what they're doing, but it appeals to their sense of duty to stand up and, and uh, scream against it. There has to be a ceasefire. They have no idea why. It sounds nice. 
Now, if Jews pander to that, our experience in history is doesn't help. On the contrary, the, the only help that explains the Rebbe in history, and the Rebbe goes through a whole lot of examples, when Jews behave like Jews in front of non-Jews, proudly declaring openly that our work is to learn to and do mitzvahs and bring Rukhnius into Gashmius, that alleviates anti-Semitism to some extent, but it won't ever be eradicated. Somebody once asked the Rebbe in dollars, there's a video of it in Jim, they asked the Rebbe in, in, uh, in, in it was in Yiddish, he asked the Rebbe, could, could uh, the Holocaust happen again? You know what the Rebbe answered? In, in a minute, before morning. This was at night when he was giving out dollars. In a minute, before morning. What's changed? Nothing's changed. Now, Hanukkah, is a tension between, in its essence, Hanukkah is a, the tension between non-Jews and Jews. That is what Hanukkah, what, that's what we're going to be celebrating. I'm, I'm going to try and explain that. But it's, it's, a diff, there, it's a different form of struggle than, for example, the struggle with Hitler, you might should know. The struggle with Hitler is the struggle with Homon, right? That's the same struggle. Homon wanted to kill Jews. Why? He didn't like Jews. Any reason for not liking Jews? Well, whatever the reason is at the moment that's fashionable, whether it's to kill their God or whether it's Marxism or whether it's money or whether it's, it's our, the way we eat, I went, to, I went to a private school, Cranbrook, and, and eating was, having good table manners was very important. You, we had to, have, had to sit with the boarders uh, and learn how to hold a knife and how to hold a fork and, and not to talk with your mouth full, not to put your elbows on the table, eat in the air, go, all these rules, right? So that we're fit to eat in Buckingham Palace. And the teacher, I'll never forget, the teacher who was teaching us this said, so that you don't eat like a Jew who eats like a, a hog. And it's true. We eat like a hog. We don't have all those table manners. We don't. The course was in the Cranbrook School. The Cranbrook School was an anti semitic would be in Kiev, in my school, he would be cutting hot as a Okay, so that and, but, the, uh, but the so part. let me just it's tell you voice, let me yeah. tell you why we have that we don't have those very beautiful table manners. You know in Halakha, so for example, you, you don't talk with your mouth full. Mm. You go to Cranbrook and you learn how to eat, you learn that you don't talk with your mouth full. That's absolutely also it's forbidden. That's the death sentence, mm. right? So why? Because it's it, it's ugly. It, it doesn't look safe. nice. It doesn't it's look not safe to you. Either. But forget the safety. It doesn't look nice. Yeah. Right. You know what happens with a Jew? You know that when we eat with, it, with each other, we are forbidden, I'll be a locker, to watch someone else eating. You're not allowed to watch someone else eating. It's, it's not your business. Like you're not allowed to go and, and, uh, and look down the, the, at your table, there's a lady sitting there, look down her clothes. Mm -hmm. That's a private clothes. You don't look at somebody when he's eating. Interesting. Huh? I had a relative who died from a joke and drinking tea. Okay. I couldn't save him. Okay. You see? It's Health dangerous. Yeah, I don't. Health not always good. <laughs> so, but. so what is, so Hitler and Homon hated Jews. So they wanted to kill Jews for whatever the reason was at the time. We have had that, and, and the war with the Greeks was also a war about Judaism, but it's a completely different kind of, it was a completely different war. And you need to understand how important this is because, and, and it's related to the candles that we light on, on Hanukkah, but 
um, which I'll come to in a minute. But first, let's understand the enormity of the problem. You should know that unlike Homon and his henchmen, unlike Hitler and the Nazis, the Greeks were very nice people. They reached a level of civilization almost unrepeated in history. Today, we probably have, have uh, repeated it, been, have, uh, gone further. But you have to understand that we, what we're talking about. This is a culture 3,000 years ago, which invented mathematics, invented theatre, invented beautiful music, invented poetry, invented... Olympics. Olympics. Philosophy. Yeah. You know, um, Rabbi Perloff told me a joke this week, yesterday when uh, I, I went in to learn in, in, in Shul with my Chavusa, that they had some donuts there. <laughs> and uh, he picked up a donut and he was walking past me and he stopped and he said, you know why Jews Ju eat donuts on, uh, on um, Hanukkah? He said, because the Greeks fashioned their bodies to be so beautiful with their athletics and their... And we want to show that we're different, so we eat donuts. <laughs> Good explanation. <laughs> so, um, but that's Rabbi Perlov's joke. Let me get back to the... the so... The Greek culture was beautiful and, and kind. I mean, they, they, there was some there was some gavura there. For example, in Sparta, if the if the, a child was born defective, they, they they threw the child out because they wanted to perfect the the human the human race or the human condition. But fundamentally, they were, they were good people and, and they had reached a very high level of, uh, of civilization to the point that they thought they were perfect. So, what did they have against Jews? They had against Jews, not their culture. They didn't object to Jewish culture. They didn't object that if we want to keep Shabbos, Shabbos is a beautiful thing. You, Six days you work, seventh day you don't work, you sit with your family, you walk to shore hand in hand, you talk, you have a lachaim, you have a kiddish. Beautiful. But don't tell me that God told you to, 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 to keep Shabbos. That's their problem. Their problem was that Jews said, God told us to do this. And we live like this out of a sense of obedience and a, sin, and a relationship with our God. That was anathema to the, the Greeks. Now the Greeks, they wanted to hear that Shabbos has a logical basis, which is admirable. You want to read poetry? You want to read Tilim? Because of the hate. That's beautiful. The, the, the poetry in Tilim is unbelievably beautiful. But don't tell me it's written by God. What's, the, what's, God got, what's God got to do with it? We want you to, and, and we 